The day that my daughter was, I went to go pick her up. She was in maybe seventh grade and she had already won a state championship at basketball. And I went to pick her up and it was raining and she was sitting on the steps soaking wet. And I wasn't late, I was on time. I couldn't understand why she was sitting there. And I said, what happened? Did they call off practice? She said, no, it started to rain and the boys got the gym and the girls were sent home. And I hit the roof <laughs> and I said, oh, no yeah. way, no way. Boys got the gym and the girls were sent home. And ever since that day, I've been ad advocating for access to women in sports. Especially uh, like a, for a country like Turkey, which is a, a secular Muslim country and where girls have certain mm -hmm. growing up, you know, the gender uh, the differences, the roles you have is really heavily on you, on your shoulders. Um, so having a support from my family, especially from my father, I think that was the main reason that I, I stayed with sports, mm -hmm. otherwise I, I wouldn't. I decided I was going to become a coach because there weren't that many lady coaches. And the rest has led me now to 40 years later that coaching girls is a critical responsibility. I'm never going to say that men shouldn't coach girls, but I am going to say that girls should coach girls when they can. Because there are things that men don't have a sensibility about when it comes to being a woman. And I relied on my older teammates for that. Your bag had to have all of your feminine supplies and all this and that. And if any older teammate looked in your bag and you didn't have everything you were supposed to have, you got in trouble. But what that really meant was that there are some women looking out for me. So like all those years, and then she got the opportunity to play in college, and she said, I'm not going to do it. And I'm, I was, what? You're not? She said, no. She said, because I'd rather have I'd rather graduate from USC with a degree that says that I'm smart and I can get paid rather than graduating as one of the um, college players, athletes, and I don't get paid because the female goalies have maybe two opportunities to go pro once you're out of college, you know, because there's not very, very many teams. And then those teams are not offering salaries that are even able to live on. Exactly. So, you know, and I said, you know, how can I argue with that? You know, because, but she gave up the opportunity to play simply because there was no money to be made as a professional. Right. And, um, you know, so, you know, the fact that people have opportunities, there's such a huge gap in the difference of the salaries of men soccer around the world, not just the U.S., and women's soccer. In New York City, one of the issues that I work on is school segregation. And so when I think about Title IX and equitable funding for sports or programs, I don't see that, how, we can't separate that from the fact that our schools are still racially segregated. Um, right. And what does that mean for black girls? What does that mean for girls of color who are now disadvantaged across um, gender and race lines? And um, there's actually a lawsuit right now in New York City challenging the unequal distribution of sports teams among public schools. My personal commitment is to write women back into our public narratives about how we have been involved in sports. Yeah. And so just for one tidbit, the first documented case of an athlete not standing for the national anthem was a black woman. Her name was Rose Robinson.